Okay, yeah. Good evening, everybody. You're all very uh, welcome to um, this Irish Wildlife Trust webinar. My name is Porrick Fogarty. I'm the campaign officer with the IWT. The IWT is a non-governmental organization. We're a charitable uh, body. We've been around since 1979, and our job is to raise awareness of the nat natural world and its importance to people. So, um, if you do feel motivated, please do join the IWT uh, and uh, you'll find all the details on our website. I'm delighted to be back um, hosting another webinar. Um, we started our webinar series last year and uh, we've had some fantastic uh, guests uh, in the last 12 months. And you can go to our website as well and you can look at all the webinars that we've held in the last 12 months and, uh, and watch them back. So please do uh, check out some of the themes that we have covered. Now, just in terms of uh, some housekeeping before uh, we get involved, um, this webinar is going to last about one hour. We'll finish up at uh, eight o'clock. Um, if you have questions for our guest, please put them into the Q&A button. Uh, you can chat amongst yourselves as much as you like using the chat function. But if you have questions for John at the end, uh, please put them in the Q&A button. So uh, John is going to give us a presentation and then uh, when he's done, we'll have some time for, uh, for questions. Uh, as I mentioned as well, we're recording this webinar and it will be available uh, in a few days. Uh, we'll put it on our YouTube channel and we put us, uh, the link to it on our on our website. So without further ado, I am very uh, honored and grateful to uh, to have uh, an esteemed guest with us this evening. John Gibbons uh, is a, a well known environmental journalist, uh, provocateur, I think, and uh, certainly one of the leading voices uh, for climate action uh, we have in Ireland. And we invited John along today because next month there's going to be a very important meeting held in Scotland, uh, in the city of Glasgow. And that is going to be the Conference of the Parties, or the COP for short, uh, which is the governmental gathering uh, around the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. I hope I got that right. Um, and basically, it's a big climate uh, uh, shindig that's going to attract a lot of attention. But will it mean uh, anything meaningful? Will there be action? coming from it. Anyway, in advance of this meeting, I thought it'd be wonderful to have John along uh, so he can share his thoughts with us on the science and the policy, where we're at, where we're going, uh, how all this is, uh, is going to pan out. So you're very welcome, John. And uh, without further ado, I will hand over to yourself. And uh, in your own time, please share your screen with us. Will do. Thank you, Borg. Now let's have a look. Share screen. Desktop number two. Share and play. Now, everybody see that okay? Is that all right, Borg? Yeah. Uh, yes, I'm seeing code red for planet Earth. Yeah. yeah, that's me. Yeah, so that's the title of the talk. So, uh, good evening, everybody. Delighted to be here, and thank you so much to Borg and the Wildlife Trust for the invite. Uh, so, this is me. This is what I do. Um, here are some of the places that I write. I pop up on the radio and other places as well uh, from time to time. So I've got a lot of slides, so I'm going to barrel ahead through, if I may. I'm going to start, uh, I guess, with simple fact that ahead of COP26, our window of choices has narrowed dramatically. Now, there's a very good reason for that, and I've kind of it's illustrated quite nicely here. This is what we've got. This is uh, 25 years, 30 years, whatever it is, 25 years of talks and meetings and protocols uh, and the journey to take concrete steps on carbon begins now and this always seems to be the case that we seem to be on a journey you will hear people regularly telling you about the journey they're on towards this that and the other towards carbon neutrality the latest journeys of course we're hearing about our journeys towards 2050 this magic magic mythical place in the comfortable future called 2050 so anyhow i guess climate goals and targets are complex and so i suppose there's a simple way, maybe a slightly blunt way to think about these climate goals and targets. And this is the best way I've ever seen it described in simple terms. So uh, if you think of it, if you look at that uh, graphic from left to right, um, basically you have 0.5, which unfortunately is behind us. We're already in the territory of pain, uh, just over the one degree centigrade territory. Uh, the question is the choice that lie ahead. And as you can see, uh, 1.5 to 
2.5, 3 and 4, all of these goals, uh, if we can call them that, all of them carry pain. There's just no getting around that. But there's different degrees of pain involved. And the choices that we make right now are going to define exactly the amount of pain that we're, we're, we're storing up for ourselves and, of course, for all future generations. So we've got, we're facing what's been described as uh, getting to choose between mitigation, adaptation, and suffering. And we, we get to decide how much of those three items uh, come to bear, let's say. And I know I can hear the people at the back saying, yeah, 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 that's grand, but what will it cost? This is always the big question that comes up, and it dominates how we cover it, particularly through the media, particularly through public policy. Um, this is a very recent example, uh, August the 27th, in fact. You know, action on global warming will come at a cost. Yes, it will. Now, inaction on global warming also comes at a cost, but this is the dominant narrative, still the dominant narrative in, in Ireland and elsewhere, driven by economists, at what will it all cost? And I suppose here's another way of seeing basically the same thing. You know, yeah, 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 emissions, but what about the economy? Now, these are important questions. The economy is where, is where, <laughs> where we, we all live. So I'm, in, I'm not denigrating it. I'm just saying that we have at the moment a lopsided discussion, in my view, uh, where the economy is taking precedence over life on Earth. Now, to try and look at that cost equation again, I want to give you a very short video from uh, Professor James Hansen. He's the former director of uh, the NASA Goddard Institute. This is very short. I hope it streams OK. And I think he, he really cuts to the chase. Imagine a giant asteroid on a direct collision course with Earth. That is the equivalent of what we face now. Yet we dither, taking no action to divert the asteroid, even though the longer we wait, the more difficult and expensive it becomes. The total energy imbalance now is about six tenths of a watt per square meter. That may not sound like much, but when added up over the whole world, it's enormous. It's about 20 times greater than the rate of energy used by all of humanity. It's equivalent to exploding 400,000 Hiroshima atomic bombs per day, 365 days per year. That's how much extra energy Earth is gaining each day. We are facing a man-made disaster of global scale. Our greatest threat in thousands of years, climate change. If we don't take action, the collapse of our civilizations and the extinction of much of the natural world is on the horizon. There you go. But the question remains, what will it cost? So the Chatham House, uh, it's a, it's a UK-based uh, think, tamp, think tank, and they published a pre-COP uh, research report, which I've been reading uh, and I've written a piece about uh, that will be appearing in the Irish Times in the next couple of weeks. Uh, so I can give you a quick flying summary of what it finds and, 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 and how it breaks down the risks. But Briefly, what they calculate is that based on the current NDCs, NDCs basically are the, the commitments made by individual national governments. They're not really binding, but the, what we, we say we'll do. Based on all the current NDCs from uh, Paris, the Paris Agreement, there's currently less than a 1% chance of remaining at or below the 1.5 line and less than a 5% chance of staying below 2 degrees C. Now, if we've learned anything from Paris and, of course, from uh, subsequent IPCC reports, is that 1.5 is very dangerous and two, 2 degrees centigrade is extremely dangerous. So back to that hacksaw uh, from a few slides back. So I'll walk you through briefly some of the Chatham House uh, findings. They, they broke up their, their analysis into distinct uh, headings, just really for clarity. The first one deals with uh, heat, productivity and health. And the question really arises, how much worse will it get? So, for example, they calculate that 3.9 billion people will be exposed to major heat waves by 2040. That's half the world's population will be exposed to major heat waves. And, and they define heat waves as essentially uh, at the very top of the most extreme heat waves that we've ever experienced to date. That's what that's the, the working definition of, of a major heat wave. This also translates in the 2040s to 10 million deaths a year. 
uh, heat related deaths and 400 million people unable to work outdoors as a result of extreme heat. I repeat, this is the 2040s. This is, you know, 18 to 20 years in our future. So this is no longer the distant future. This is the near future. So that's heat, productivity, health. Now let's look at food security. Okay, a couple of important things to bear in mind here, of course, we're going to need a lot more food. How we produce it is obviously up for debate. Uh, we know we're going to produce, we're going to need an awful lot more food. We're going to probably need around 50% more food by mid-century, uh, but yields, global yields are likely to decline at the moment. The estimate, the best estimate is a 30% decline in the absence of dramatic emission reductions. And there's also the likelihood by the 2040s of all the major bread baskets having simultaneous failures. Now, that means global drought, or sorry, global famine by the 2040s. Now, uh, to me, that has a, a kind of a ring to it. There's a certain symmetry there, but just this is the scale of the threats that they're facing. This is in the absence of dramatic emissions reduction. So basically those targets that we talked about earlier, the 1.5 and the twos, if we miss those, this is where we're heading. So closely related to this, of course, is water security. What way are we heading? How much worse can it get? Again, by 2040, remember that's only 18, 19 years out, 700 million people exposed to drought. And if you see the chart to the right, you can see there's, there are uh, obviously uh, error ranges in that, but it is rising and it's rising fast and the risks are rising. So we're looking at 700 million people worldwide exposed to drought and large parts of the world with more than 10% of their population impacted by prolonged and severe drought. And they say these droughts are as bad as the, the, the dust bowl droughts of the 1930s. So these are historic droughts that we're facing into the 2040s. And 2040s are right around the, in, in reality, in, in human terms, they're right around the corner. So flooding is another major risk. We're looking at uh, 200 million people at risk of frequent devastating, what they call 100 year floods. And of course, rising sea levels, uh, we're locking in, by the way, if we hold at two degrees centigrade, which <laughs> some people uh, imagined was a safe limit, we're locking in long-term committed sea level rise of 12 meters if we hold at two degrees. In other words, if we don't reduce, if we actually let it get to two degrees, never mind beyond two degrees. Now, long-term, by the way, could be very long-term. This is not going to happen in the 21st century, but we're locking it in and committing every future generation to the consequences of our decisions or the actions that we didn't take. So these are really, really big decisions. So anyway, to, to finish up with the, with the Chatham House, uh, they've put together here, uh, and there will be a quiz about this at the end, so pay attention. Uh, this is basically looking at what are called tipping points and cascading risks. This is where one hazard trips off another hazard, and then it, it amplifies and multiplies it. So most of us would know this is the domino effect. And if you look to the right column, we're looking at risks that go along civil war, war, uh, organized crime, violence, regional conflict. In one of their scenarios, uh, you're talking about full-scale armed conflict, regional wars, even up to local and regional nuclear wars. So this is what happens when these uh, risks these risks become unmanageable quite quickly. So taking a step back from Chatham House and, and just drawing the lens out a little bit, we've got, as everybody on this call I'm sure knows, we have the economic domain that we all fret about and the social domain where we live. But in reality, all of these are, of course, wholly owned subsets of the ecological domain. This is the domain, this is the invisible, the invisible partner that keeps the whole show on the road. And yet it gets forgotten about in all the discussions which tend to be dominated by economics and, and the economic domain, and rightly so, of course, with the social domain, but the, 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 the thing that's keeping this show on the road is the ecological domain. So we need to have a quick look at that. Again, there'll be no, no news here for, for people, I'm sure, from the Wildlife Trust, but anyway, we'll have a quick, quick run through this. So this is a, a very famous uh, slide set looking at Earth's land mammals by weight. Each square you see on your screen represents a million tons of meat in simple terms. And the humans are the uh, dark um, gray in the middle by weight. Our pets and livestock are the light gray and the little green areas dotted around the edges. That is the wildlife remaining in the world. OK, to translate that into maybe another another way of looking at it. Uh, this is a planet dominated by domesticated animals and humans. So going from left to right, um, cattle, humans, pigs, sheep, and goats. So the fifth most populous after those is all the wild vertebrates in the world. 
then we continue on with horse, chickens, rats, camels, donkeys, etc. Uh, so it's it's quite something. Um, I think it's very important to keep this in mind that this we're not here talking about things that may happen in the future. I've just been talking about 2030 and 2040. This is today, right now. This is what we've already done. And this is what we have to live with. And I guess have to look at how are we going to reverse some of these? Uh, because, I mean, it's pretty obvious those trends uh, can't continue to their logical or illogical conclusion. And I suppose, leaving aside the dancing cow on our left here, this is uh, what it might all look like. Uh, the, 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 the enthusiastic, energetic progress of one species and its support species, uh, with everything else basically getting pushed off the, off the chart. Again, turning that into numbers, uh, we're humans and all our domestic animals, we outweigh all the land-based vertebrates of the world by a factor of 42. Uh, so that's this, this gigantic uh, shift really that has happened in the Holocene only in the last 10 to 12,000 years, and specifically in the last 150 years, and even more specifically since what's called the Great Acceleration from about 1950 onwards, when the human footprint has drastically expanded across the face of the earth. Now. Some kingdoms have stood longer than others. So humans are around in our current form about 200,000 years. Um, insects, arthropods are around about 400 million years. They precede uh, the dinosaurs, for example, by about 150 million years. So they were here, they're here a very long time, but um, they're in radical decline as well. There's a very famous study from Germany, which I'm sure you've heard about, about drastic insect population declines. And this is seen, it isn't just a German uh, consequence, we're seeing this all over the world. Um, here's a headline from The Guardian from a couple of years back. They describe as plummeting insect numbers threaten the collapse of nature. Because as we all know, um, we cannot function. The biosphere cannot function without its insects. They're the, they're the building blocks and absolutely critical to a functioning biosphere. Um, how critical, I guess, we'll only fully understand if we do manage to succeed in our quest to wipe them out. So, again, to draw the lens a little narrower this time, I think it's important, here's a, a headline from an Irish publication, and pointing out that animals and plants are disappearing faster than at any other time in human history, and it's happening in Ireland. And uh, this is something, of course, that we've been fantastic at convincing ourselves that all the bad things that happen in the world are happening in faraway places like Brazil, where these awful people don't understand. And what about the green island? What about origin green? Well, um, if you can spot the green in this particular Natura uh, chart, well, you're, you've got better eyes than I do. Um, our ecological integrity on our little island is extremely compromised. Um, now, this didn't all happen five minutes ago, we know that, uh, but we have to be honest and, and, and look at the facts, look at the situation where we're at, and all I will say on the positive side of a, a slide like this is, uh, maybe things can only get better, because we're, we've pretty much bottomed out in terms of our, of our ecology on our own island. So again, to try and frame some of what we've talked about here over the last few minutes into context. I think that's maybe what's missing. And, you know, Jim Hansen talked earlier about uh, a meteor strike. Now, we did have a meteor strike some time back, and this is alluded to in a Washington Post article that I snipped out from a couple of years back. And they make the point that what we're currently doing to the Earth, there is no parallel in Earth history for 66 million years when we had a sudden abrupt mass extinction event. And of course, in geological times, we are currently in and triggering a mass extinction event on a scale that hasn't been witnessed in 66 million years. So I think that's incredibly important to keep in mind. So now I've managed so far to avoid the science side of things, so I'm not going to go, go into too deeply, but sometimes it's important to, to kind of try and get your moving points over time because we can, we can all easily be beguiled by uh, subtle shifts. So I've called this slide a tale of two heat waves. One is 1976 in Ireland and the other is 2018, okay? So first slide here, if you, if you look at it, uh, you'll notice in the middle, uh, we had ourselves a heat wave in June, 1976 uh, over Ireland, Britain, uh, some continental Europe and a few other spots around the world. So we had a very similar heat wave to that and very similar temperatures experienced in June 2018. So you roll the clock forward uh, that number of years. And this is the June 2018 heat wave. Okay. So again, you notice that Ireland and Britain and 
a larger chunk of continental Europe enjoyed uh, very high temperatures. Uh, we had a, an actual drought on the island of Ireland. Uh, we had to import fodder for our animals, etc. But what you'll now notice in particular is that the, this is no longer a regional event. It's now a global event. In fact, I want to step this one back to show you one other little thing. If you look at the, the scale at the bottom, you'll notice that the, the extreme right hand scale runs to 5.0. Okay. Now have a look at the extreme right hand scale in the next slide. They've actually had to move it out. That's how much temperatures have shifted in that period. Now, so we know where we've been, we know where we've got to. The big question is, where are we going? So scientists took the 2018 uh, heat wave and modeled it for 2070. So they took the same conditions of the 2018 heat wave and added 50 years of global warming using what's called RCP 6.0, which is kind of not quite business as usual, but a little step or two uh, below business as usual. Business as usual, of course, is RPC 8.5. So RPC 6.0 would be a better case than we are on now, but it, it would be still involve a significant amount of fossil fuel burning uh, through the century. So here's the 2018 heat wave with an additional 50 years of background global warming added to it. Okay. So as you can see, what we're looking at here is a different world. Now, that's been a lot of talk. So what I'm going to take a very quick sus and hand you over to the good people from ConocoPhillips who've been looking at solutions and also at our energy needs for the future. At ConocoPhillips, we drill oil in the most inhospitable places on Earth, from the baking desert to the frozen tundra. And when burning that oil causes the tundra to become unfrozen, we don't give up. We refreeze that tundra using giant chillers. And when burning the oil to power the chillers causes catastrophic hurricanes and flooding, we don't back down. We build a humongous impenetrable dome over our drills and move inside with all our money. Food runs low, but we don't quit. We turn to cannibalism, feasting on human flesh to keep on drilling until the Earth's destroyed and everyone's dead. But do we quit then? Yes, then I guess we quit. <laughs> Phillips. maybe we didn't think this through. <laughs> Now, that particular clip uh, you might see from the bottom left was uh, on the Jimmy Kimmel show. They actually last week, uh, seven of the major US uh, late night comedy shows kind of had a had a climb at night and they did various things. But just think how far we've come that you can ridicule a major oil company like that in public as blatantly as that. So I think what we're seeing here is a, is a, a real shift. And folks like that are losing their social license quickly. The way that the tobacco industry lost its social license. I'm, I'm old enough to remember when PJ Carroll, the, the cigarette company, sponsored um, the GEA All-Stars and they sponsored, they sponsored the, uh, the, the horse show and the RDS. In fact, the, all the riders in the horse show had to actually smoke. They were given free cigarettes and they were encouraged very strongly to always be seen smoking PJ Carroll every time the camera was on them. So that seems a little unimaginable now, but that's what happens when social norms shift. And I think the fossil fuel industry is having an existential moment uh, of its own at the moment, uh, but not nearly quickly enough. So there is also, of course, the issue of who's doing all this. Now, I put up two slides here, I guess, or two, two images. Um, and just to make the point that, that this is not being driven equally. And while the poor may be getting the brunt of climate impacts, they're not the ones driving this crisis. And an Oxfam study pointed out that uh, it's the richest 1% are causing more than twice the emissions of the poorest 50%. That's probably no surprise. But I think the, the lower one where, where I've circled is that the global rich must cut their carbon footprint by 97% to stave off climate change. Now, you might be sitting there thinking, well, foo, that's not me. But you'd be surprised uh, how many people in Ireland, uh, you know, if you're in the middle class at all in Ireland, uh, you on a global basis, you're a part of that too. You may not be Bill Gates or, or Jeff Bezos, but uh, the middle classes in countries like Ireland, we are part of the 1%, I'm sorry to say. Uh, now, as I say, climate impacts affect people differently. And 
couple of slides to illustrate that. I guess uh, this is one taken from Venice, I think, a couple of years back. So here's some some uh, shoppers up to their knees in climate and climate impacts, as we would call it. Uh, in the developing world, um, people are already up to their necks in it. And of course, not just climate impacts, but they're also up to their necks in the waste products of our civilization that are accumulating much, much faster than we're able to deal with them or we're able to process them. So uh, it's an image that really sticks in my mind uh, when, we, when we think about climate justice. And also when we hear Irish people saying other people should do stuff, we're, 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 why should we? It's not up to us. Um, we don't make a difference. Yes, we do. We, <laughs> in terms of pollution, we outperform. Um, we're one of the most, one of the largest per capita polluters in the European Union. And on a global scale, we're right up the top table of per capita polluters. So yes, what we do here really does matter. And it matters to people um, who, I guess, do not have the resilience and the revenues and the, the, the backup plans and the, the funding and the subsidies that we enjoy that prop up our lifestyle. So I guess the type of challenges that, that they and increasingly us are facing are summarized in this report from Thomson Reuters Foundation, where they describe um, the climate change and disease, the, the threat it poses. Now, that headline I've used for a couple of years, this one I actually uh, was from this summer. And of course, we all know the summer of 2021, I guess, changed things somewhat. And this is a, a headline that showed um, Head, or extreme weather sweeping the world with devastating floods and wildfires on three continents at once. And I think this is your, your climate, I could call it a double whammy, called it a triple whammy. This is where things are no longer coming in ones or twos, they're now coming in waves. And I go back to those compound cascading events that I referred to earlier, where one event is tripping another event that's tripping another event. Uh, and we seem to be quickly moving out of our stable um, climatic regime that has persisted for 10,000 years and into a new, quite different regime. And it's happening a hell of a lot faster than people seem to understand. So I suppose some of the coverage you've seen from the summer, uh, this is the Los Angeles Times, uh, record setting heat wave shows that climate change is creating, hmm, okay. Uh, again, from the Telegraph, this is the UK Telegraph, um, they've upgraded now to four continents with catastrophic outbreaks of extreme weather. And what that tells you really is this is no longer, uh, we often think of weather as a regional and, and a local uh, event, but when you're getting extreme events happening simultaneously across multiple continents, then you know that the axis, uh, the climatic axis has shifted. And as I say, I believe it's shifted a lot faster than most of us uh, would like to imagine. So the New York Times summarized it like this, in particularly in relation to uh, the, the impacts on wildlife. They said the, the collapse from climate change is predicted to hit suddenly and sooner. They say scientists found a cliff edge instead of a slippery slope. So this just suggests that some of these uh, compound impacts, um, they because of the, the domino effect, they just, um, a slight nudge in the system creates ripples that we just don't see coming that hit a small sides. And again, another analysis uh, pointing out that one fifth of countries are currently at risk of ecosystem collapse. Now, I'm not going to drill down into who they are, but it really is uh, quite something, the notion of one in five countries on Earth at risk of ecosystem collapse. Um, there was a large study that was published last year that I think it's worth taking a minute or two to walk our way through. And this uh, summarized again here in the Washington Post, they said that global warming is likely to push billions outside the climatic range that has sustained society for 6,000 years. So if you look closely at the image now, um, whoops, no, that didn't work. Okay. Oh, it does actually, that's fine. Yeah. Uh, so they calculate that 3 billion people will be living in what they call near unlivable temperatures by 2070. And again, 2070, is as close to where we are now as 1970. Okay, so it's, you know, certainly um, it is not the distant future. And they say the climate niche that has supported humanity will shift more in the next 50 years than in the preceding 6,000 years. So this is how quickly that axis, that balance is shifting. Now, I'll put that slide up that I had up a second ago, and this time I'll add in um, details of the areas of the world that are expected to be uninhabitable. 
uh, for humans, not at, not at all times in the year, but for sections of the year. Now you'll notice to, to your left, you have an area currently known as the Amazon rainforest. So unfortunately, uh, in these projections, it will not be, that won't be there. Uh, and these areas, uh, at the moment, by the way, uh, it's estimated that less than 1% of the land surface of the earth is uninhabitable for humans. That's in deep deserts. And this is heading from 1% to 19%. And unfortunately, the 19% in, in question is heavily, heavily populated. And to give you a sense of just how heavily populated, I did a little uh, home DIY graphic here. The island of Ireland has a population of give or take 6 million, there and abouts. Uh, now, what we're looking at here is the loss, the displacement potentially of 500 times the population of Ireland, uh, finding where they live to be uninhabitable. For And again, it doesn't have to be uninhabitable 12 months of the year. If where you live is uninhabitable for two or three months of the year, where do you go? What happens? So the UN have looked at this. And they've tried to do some calculations. And one of them from the, from the UN University estimated uh, different ranges from a low forecast of 25 million, which they pretty much ruled out, to a high estimate of 1 billion by 2050. This again, this is less than 30 years out, uh, either moving within the countries or across borders. Um, so that's the potential range we're looking at there. The median range they, they use on that is an estimate of about 200 million climate refugees by mid-century. So you've got to ask yourself, what happens when you've got 200 million people on the move? Cast your mind back to 2015, when we had two or three million people trying to flee the Middle East. Uh, and the, the look at how that changed the politics of Europe and the, in the European Union. And arguably it precipitated, um, certainly was one of the, um, the factors that, that precipitated Brexit and that led to Trumpism. And that was the political destabilization by the perceived threat of mass migration. And that was in the low millions. This is in this is so we're looking at a completely different uh, level here. So when the going gets tough, obviously the tough get greenwashing. Now I want to apologize to in advance for showing this next clip, but I have shortened it. So it, it this is just really really short version of it, and I apologize to everybody involved, especially Sirsha. Ireland can become a world leader in sustainably produced food and drink. It's a bold ambition, but it can be realized because sustainability has always been at the source of who we are. Think about it. Our climate has always been this mild. Our landscape, this lush. Our fields have always been this green swept and rain washed. Our seas have always teemed with fish. The elements have always conspired here to make great farming possible. Yep, um, she did say rain washed, by the way, just in case you misheard that, it was rain washed. Okay. Um, and then, of course, the other clip from a couple of years back, which thankfully has been retired from our friends in Bordnemona. There is one company in Ireland as diverse as the thousands of communities they serve and the island we all call home. One company leading the change to ensure a sustainable future for all of us, generating renewable energy in diverse and innovative ways, powering homes and businesses, managing the land and considering its use from a social, economic and environmental perspective warming hearts and winning the hearts of gardeners everywhere. That company, Board Namona, naturally driven. Yes, indeed. And uh, I should add, by the way, it's very, um, I wanted to pass on greetings from uh, Quilcha, who celebrated uh, World Habitat Day, uh, apparently in the last 24 hours with a tweet that got a lot of uh, people very excited about uh, Quilcha's, uh, shall we say, ecological credentials. So anyway, I guess these are companies working hard to create a particular impression. Uh, now, where does reality uh, collide with these impressions? Well, let's drop a few headlines just for your delectation. Again, I don't expect anybody on this call will be surprised or shocked by any of these. But as I said, our, our ecology, our biodiversity, our wildlife, our in dire straits on this island. And that's terrible, of course it is. 
But for me, what's worst is our absolute refusal to accept that basic fact. And until you accept something, you can't start fixing it. Unless you admit that it's broken, nobody starts fixing it. And we're still deluding ourselves that we're, you know, this Emerald Isle, this Origin Green, all this stuff, all these stories that we tell ourselves. And I don't know, I, you can only do that, in my opinion, for, for so long. There is also, of course, another type of uh, pollution that we, we, we don't often talk about in, in environmental and climate circles. And apologies if it's a slight detour from where I'm going so far, but uh, I, think it's, I think it's really worth uh, taking a moment or two to look at it, maybe to help explain how we, <laughs> how we get into this state. This is a public information warning from the Ministry for the Climate Emergency. We want to warn you about a poorly understood problem. You've heard of water pollution, you've heard of air pollution, <laughs> and noise pollution. But have you heard about the dangers of brain pollution? We're exposed to thousands of sources of brain pollution every day. They're almost wherever you look. This pollution, in the form of advertising, passes through your body's defenses and becomes lodged in the brain, where it rewires you, forming physical structures. Repeated exposure causes permanent change to the brain, affecting behavior and how you see the world. Symptoms can include buying things you do not need, wanting things that will not make you happy, feelings of inadequacy, a prevailing sense that excessive consumption and waste are a normal problem. But some advertising infections are even more toxic and sinister. It's like how in the Amazon, ants can become infected by spores from the parasitic cordyceps fungus, which takes control of their minds, directing them to behave in ways that benefit the fungus, but endanger the ant. We have to tell you, this never ends well. Adverts for fossil fuels and for high carbon goods and services like flights and SUVs act in much the same way as the cordyceps fungus. The climate emergency is putting all of us in terrible danger. Yet we're constantly exposed to adverts telling us to keep buying things that make the problem worse. Thankfully, it's not too late to act. Here's what you can do to protect you, your family and friends against brain pollution. Support campaigns to stop adverts fueling the climate emergency. Call on your council to end adverts for high carbon polluting products. As I say, it's something we just don't talk about very much. There's this background assumption and, and you see it every day. You know, you might hear a piece on the radio uh, and they say, we must act, we must do this, we must do that. You know, you see something in the paper and right beside it is an Aer Lingus ad telling you to fly to the States for, you know, 129 euros. And this is creating this massive and growing cognitive dissonance where we're kind of going, look, if it is really that bad, then all this stuff would stop. But the people in charge obviously don't think it's that bad because if they did, they wouldn't let this continue to happen. If they really thought we were in a climate emergency, if they actually knew or internalized what the phrase emergency actually means, well, then we would be changing our society, our economy, uh, our marketing. I think we'd be shutting a hell of a lot of it down. And we'd be saying, okay, what, what, how do we fulfill human needs? We can't fulfill human desires, not all of them anyway. Uh, and how do we rewire ourselves? How do we clean up the brain pollution, if you like, to begin to, to revisit the world, not as a predatory species that is simply uh, you, you know, using the resources of the world as a quarry and the, the natural ecosystems as a dump. And at the moment it is quarry to dump that ever, ever hastening circle of activity that we're turning the natural world uh, into uh, as the byproducts of this accelerated uh, consumption phase. And it really is, might seem a little off the beam for a, for a, for a wildlife uh, trust meeting, but until we address that, and I hear nobody talking about it, uh, I'm not sure where we're, where we're going to get to with this. Anyway, so back to science ever so briefly. Um, this is just a, a paper that looked at this some time back, and they made the point, I think, and it's really important to say that, and this is not, by the way, a criticism of science, science at all, or of scientists. Uh, 
who I think have done their absolute best in, in the main on this. It's just the way the system works. There has been a tendency to what they call the path of least drama. And the skeptics of the reality and the significance of anthropogenic climate change have frequently accused science climate scientists of alarmism. And this study found the available evidence suggests that scientists have in fact been conservative in their projections of the impacts of climate change. And you can understand why, especially if you're getting thrashed every time you say anything. And one of the lead authors of this was Naomi Oreskes, who has written, she's a science historian of science, and she's written brilliantly uh, on the, 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 the global strategy by the um, tobacco industry uh, to sell doubt as a product. That was the phrase, in fact, that was developed in 1969 by the tobacco industry. And they said, doubt is our product. And if we can sow doubt in the public's mind about any issue, whether it is the safety of cigarettes or whether global warming is real, then we can create enough confusion and we can always find some, some bogus scientists to buy off to say our side of the story. And the media then can referee in the middle and the public will, will just disengage because they don't know who's right and they don't know who's wrong. So. As I mentioned, and I'm moving towards the end of my set fairly soon, um, but another scientist uh, who I think he explored this very, very well, a guy called Gus Speth, and he wondered as a scientist where to begin. And he put it like this. He said, I used to think the top environmental problems were biodiversity loss, ecosystem collapse, and climate change. This rang a bell with me, by the way, because in my naivety, when I first approached this, that's what I thought. And anyway, so Speth goes on to say, I thought that with 30 years of good science, we could address these problems. But he admits, I was wrong. He said the top environmental problems are selfishness, greed, and apathy. And to deal with these, we need a spiritual and cultural transformation. And we scientists, we don't know how to do it. So that's his point. Now, it's maybe a little harsh to say selfishness, greed, and apathy. And I think it's very important to say that we're swimming in a contaminated sea. We're, we're surrounded and bombarded from an early age with messaging, with advertising, with promotion, and of course, with peer pressure, with SUVs, with all of that, that paraphernalia of success and what you're supposed to do and expectation of your peers and your parents and so on. And now we found ourselves in a, in, a, in a really a brand new landscape where we just haven't navigated before. We don't quite know what to do. Uh, all the things that we thought, all the things that I thought as a, as a young person uh, that, you know, I was supposed to work hard and get a job and move forward and career and yada, 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 and accumulate money and get a house and all the rest. And then all of a sudden you turn around and go, well, hang on, is this, could this all end up underwater? And the answer I'm afraid is that's the way we're heading. So some very strange stuff is starting to show up in the in the literature, let's say, and this is one just pull out a couple of the headlines that I've been looking at. Uh, this is from uh, 2018. Researchers are thinking about widespread social collapse and how to prepare for it. This, by the way, isn't to take a doomless position on this. The future is not set. It is merely to focus the mind that unless we take drastic action, this is what we're locking ourselves in for. This is not nobody, by the way, <laughs> is adapting to um, life at the bottom of the sea. Right, so forget about that, that the term adaptation is, is, is used, I think, lightly here. But again, uh, the, the so-called deep adaptation here, um, navigation of tragedy and so on, these are, these are just the, the, the straws in the wind, let's just say, in terms of where the research community are looking at, how we begin to get our heads around this. But none of these, and I stress this, none of these are an excuse for inaction. I've doomism and i think we're all susceptible to it i know i have been over the years the temptation to just throw your hat at and say we can't do this well actually we can't not do this this is the thing we can't not do this so that's whenever i feel despondent and feel like i just can't go on i just say well actually you can't not go on and i think that's the same for any of us in this and i'm sure there's many people on this call who know exactly what i mean by this and dr kate marvel who's a, who's a, a wonderful climatologist and a great science communicator she put it beautifully uh, i think as an antidote to hope she said we don't need hope we need courage not hope to face climate change and i think it's a great way of putting it and that's what i that's what i think any of us would want is probably courage uh, i think we've had 30 years of hope and in the 30 years, by the way, that we've had intergovernmental processes and conferences of the party since 1990, in that 30 years, we have emitted as much CO2 in that 30 years than in all of human history up to 1990. So 
the incrementalist approach, the do a little bit, it makes a little difference approach has taken us to the gates of hell. It hasn't worked, it has failed absolutely. So I'll finish anyway on, on a, a, a corny old um, little video that I enjoy um, anyway. Uh, and it's really called the three stages of grief. And I define them as number one, despair, get it out of the way. Number two, accept. And number three, and my favorite one, act. We have had your test results. May I be blunt with you? No. Right. Well, everything is fine. You're not going to die. Oh, that's brilliant. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <sighs> Okay, folks, that's it. Thank you all very much for your attention and uh, happy to take any questions. And if, if anybody is, uh, if, unless you've all just left and gone to the pub, in which case I wouldn't blame you one little bit. But anyway, hey, Porik, there you are. I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> I will, will I disconnect my, can I unshare this? or Please, yes, that? stop sharing your screen now. Thanks yes, very stop much. Stop sharing. Here we go. For the love of God, says Porik, stop sharing your screen. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Okay, has that, has that worked? That doesn't work. So, John, thank you so much for that. Um, and uh, it's always nice that you inject some humor into it because uh, Lord knows we need we need some. Uh, we have to take it all very seriously, but uh, but but uh, it is important that we um, remind ourselves that uh, there are things we can do and there are things that we have to do and need to do and so on. Um, before, uh, just I'll remind um, our audience, please, to put your question for John into the Q&A. We have about 10, 15 minutes uh, for a few questions. Um, and just to get the ball rolling, John, I mean, we've got um, this this big meeting coming up in, in Glasgow. I mean, uh, yes, there'll be an awful lot of talking about it. I'm sure there'll be an awful lot of people saying this is the last chance and that the time for talking is over and the talking will go on. I mean, uh, are these any use at all? Well, I think, yes, they are, right? Without these frameworks, we've got nothing, okay? So in the absence of the intergovernmental frameworks, we've got nothing. What the frameworks have given us is they're showing us what we need to do. They're showing us how we need to get there. Now, the fact that governments then go home and don't do it, you can't blame the COP framework for that. They're at least giving us an honest assessment of what we need to do. And the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is doing the science, right? And the COP then gives you the framework for saying, how do we get science and policy together? What's been missing, Porg, is politicians stopping going to these conferences and making fine speeches and then lying their asses off when they come home and pretending that climate and biodiversity emergency and the wildlife crash is just some kind of, of, a, of a, a sideshow. That's the heartbreaker for me. We can, you know, is this going to be easy? Hell no. Can we fix this? Can we stop this getting, you know, completely terrible? Yes, we can. And as I said, anybody who thinks that it's time to quit and it's time to give up and go home now, they really aren't looking at how serious the situation is. It's just far too serious to, to be throwing the hat at it. So yeah, so yes, it, 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 the COP process is the best that we have. It's not only the best that we have, Borg, it's the only thing we have. Yeah, um, yeah, it is worthwhile. And I mean, I, I feel a sense of despair for a lot of the scientists. Many of them at this stage are getting old and gray and putting their entire career into these things and, and maybe thinking that people have been listening to them all these, these years, when in fact they haven't. I have a question here from Grace. Um, and it's really to do with maybe with what you've just been saying about the rhetoric and the language that have been that, that has been used uh, in presenting uh, the data that uh, you you have showed, uh, and 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 around how how that language could change to uh, basically so that we we start acting a little bit more. Yeah, I it's something as a science communicator I've grappled with or tried to grapple with for years now and you know do I soft soap it do I come on heavy you know how how do any of us manage these things right and you know and I think the scientists will all say exactly the same thing they're they're just they're very bothered 
But what I do find is that there are many scientists, people like Dr. Peter Kalmus uh, and others who are coming forward and saying, you know, we have got to stop pretending that this is a science problem. This is not a science problem, Boric. This is a human problem. This is a brain wiring problem. This is a, a society with the button jammed on self-destruct problem. Now, at the moment, the destruction is happening in nature. But we've created this weird moat around human civilization that we've tried to psychologically isolate ourselves from nature. And I'm sure you guys in the Wildlife Trust know all about that, how people feel disconnected from nature. Now, that's a fatal assumption in my view. We have got to reconnect with nature. I don't know how, but we've got to do it because if nature goes down, there's only one thing we can say for sure. She's taken us with her. Yeah, there's there's uh, there's no doubt about that. But I mean, and it was it was interesting your selection of videos in your in your talk there because the the one from Origin Green, you know, side by side the one with the one from Conoco uh, Phillips, uh, it was hard to know which one was the parody and which one was was supposed to be serious. <laughs> and we know that the the government has committed to strengthening Origin Green, uh, which is a bit of a bit of a worry. Um, yeah. I have an, an anonymous attendee here, which, which uh, but, the, but the question really doesn't need to be anonymous, but he's asking you, John, is there anything in the National Development Plan that would give you hope, dare you say it, courage? Hope. <laughs> okay, look, the commitments, the two to one commitment for, for um, public transport over private, that's, uh, that really is brand new. Um, 500,000 uh, home retrofits. Look, how many of these will get over the line? Uh, I'm not sure. What I will say is a lot of the road building projects are going to get shot down in flames because of the, the, the fact that we now have a climate overarching um, framework. Now, there's a lot of politicians who have already been out telling their, their, their constituents they're going to have a nice new motorway thanks to the NDP. Well, they're not, right? So I think that's good. Uh, so I think the, the National Development Plan is an awful lot better because there is at least one party that is ecologically literate involved there. Um, you know, they're only one, they're only one of three, they've only got 12 TDs, but I will give them some credit on this, that uh, try and imagine for a moment the same NDP without those people involved in it. Just imagine how much worse it would be. Imagine the conversations we wouldn't even be having. So that's why, whether it's, whether it's the Greens or whether it's the Social Democrats or Labour, whoever takes it up, we so need uh, ecology parties to be to be uh, represented at, at cabinet. Um, I think that's a that's a point well made. Um, uh, there's a few questions here. One from Anne uh, about uh, you know what would you say to artists who want to work in this area, and and, and maybe what what do you say to people who aren't maybe eco-literate uh, in this area or just regular Joe Sobes who are just very concerned about it. What, 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 what would you say to those people? I think whatever your skills, we all have skills, right? Um, whatever your skills, I think we need to put them to the service of this issue. That's my view, right? I'm, I'm a scribbler, a bit of a talker. That's all I can do. I have very few other skills, not a proper, not even a proper environmentalist. So I do what I can do. There's everybody on this call has skills. So look at what you can do. If you're an artist, brilliant. Well, then there's a way because we need to communicate with people and we need to do it in a huge hurry. This is the thing we really need to do in a hurry. We don't, we can't leave this to the quote environmentalists. We know that there's too few of them. They're too overworked. They're too stretched too thinly. We all need to become environmentalists whether we like it or not and we need to also stretch the definition of environmentalism another thing Borg, that i read recently that really struck at me and it says and it said this do not be expecting perfection of people in this area and do not be pointing fingers and saying oh he's got this or she's got that everybody should be allowed to do what they can do some people can do a lot some people can do a little but we all have got to pitch in absolutely um there's, there's a couple of questions here about uh, lobbying and uh, Owen puts it thus, uh, how effective are industry lobbyists in blunting meaningful climate legislation in Ireland? Well, we know for a fact, and Oisin uh, Coughlin of Friends of the Earth has talked about this at length, that the, the 
a combination of the IFA and IBEC killed climate legislation in 2010. They killed it stone dead. So we're now 10 years behind where we should be, thanks to the power of lobbyists and access to ministers. So we have lost a decade in this country of climate action. So lobbyists are a huge problem. They're an absolutely massive problem. And their access to ministers, their, the, the fearfulness that politicians feel of some of these lobbies is, you know, I, I find it, you know, a little depressing to live in a democracy where, um, you know, and there's so many good things about Ireland, by the way, so many wonderful things about Ireland, and yet we have we have some out of control lobbying. And also something, if I can add, I think some of the some of the anti environmental language that I've been hearing coming through uh, some 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 particularly say through the farming press, some really terrible uh, attacks on on generic environmentalists using phrases like jihadis and so on. So I think we need to watch that. These lobbies, and the reason, by the way, they're getting so so uh, extreme is they're feeling the heat. They know that the public, they know that politicians are starting to get the memo. A few years back, they were quite chill about things, whereas now they feel the heat and they're starting, as I said, to, to, to really amp it up. But I think we need to keep our public discourse respectful on both sides, on all sides. I include myself in that. We've got to be respectful. And, but we've also got to stop extreme language creeping in because extreme language is always the prelude to extreme actions. Um, indeed. Um, on the, the Climate uh, Act uh, that it is now, um, I mean, uh, for somebody uh, uh, on, on, let's say, my side of the fence, this is where we're working in, in biodiversity issues for so long, we have an absolute mountain of legislation around protected habitats and species and water and you know that has been completely ineffective why would the climate act uh, that we passed this summer be any different great question great question well first of all i, I bloody hope it is uh, i do believe so because this many of the things that you've described are kind of seen as peripheral legislation they're not at sent they're not at the heart of government but essentially what we're looking at are carbon budgets and targets that are as intrinsic to governance as financial budgets and this is what we got out of our much maligned climate act we have this up until that we had nothing right we have that now and what we the activists the lobbyists on on our side if you like uh need to do is to make damn sure that doesn't get watered down anymore you may know that just before just as the climate act was going through there was frantic last minute lobbying and attempts on on the the side of what i would call the inactivists right the people actively lobbying for nothing right uh, as in for no change uh to tear it down but but i'm not despondent pouring on this and i completely agree with you and if you take things like marine protected areas and so on the problem there is there just aren't enough people in politics who give a damn about it i'm just sorry to say it and many of the rural politicians feel more afraid of uh local interests than they are prepared to fight for nature and, and you know that far better than i do yeah and, and i suppose maybe it points as well to a need for us all to be holding our politicians to account now for the climate act and to to i suppose support them maybe in making some hard decisions as well as, as just uh, hitting them over the head all the time um uh, we're coming up to eight o'clock but there's a, an interesting if, if it, perhaps a little bit technical question uh, from mary but i do think it's interesting and she asks um how big a role will the insurance companies and the ethical investment funds you might explain what that is, uh, play in getting things on track. Yeah, I mean, I, I've, I've written about this in, in a couple of places, including the Business Post recently. There is a shift. I mean, uh, you find the global reinsurance industry, you know, you, you, can, you can bullshit certain sectors, but reinsurance and insurance, and there's a company called Munich RA, and they have tracked an explosion in climate-related insurance losses, and it's going up in a straight line. Now, they know, and that is having an influence because, of course, it's costing the industry billions. Now, you get to a point quite quickly where whole sectors can become uninsurable. And by the way, I'm hoping that certain sectors become uninsurable. I'm hoping that the fossil fuel industry becomes an uninsurable risk very soon. I also, by the way, would love, if I can just add as a quick rider, uh, we need to push for an ecocide law at international level, at the International Criminal Court, so that people who are involved in destroying ecosystems can be pursued through the criminal courts. That's what's missing in my view. At the moment, it is, oh, you know, here, write a check for 10 million euros or $10 million, oh, and spend the next 20 years in court arguing about it. The people who are doing this 
have addresses they sh that we need to attach liability and criminal liability to people who are involved in ecological destruction we know who they are yes absolutely and and i think that is something that is growing in in uh, support as well internationally and uh, also the uh, the cause for a, a change to our constitution here in ireland to have a, to provide a right to a, a clean and healthy environment uh, for people i think might be might be uh, on the list as well can i just say Porik, briefly I, i'm just uh, having a sneaky scroll through the the q a here there's some really lovely comments and i just want to say to everybody I, i'm not going to get to thank you individually i just want to thank people collectively i'm i'm really glad Thank you so much. Uh, it really, really matters so much. The the kind words, the support, the you know that we all need to keep soldiering on here. And I and I can't tell you how much it means. I I, I really, from the bottom of my heart, thank you to everybody. Yes, and, and I think it is it's encouraging to have uh, events like this where we see such a great turnout and um, and there are a lot of people out there who I think are uh, as worried as you are and uh, and are keen to, to do something. And on that note, I'll just highlight uh, Katie Holton's um, comment there about the, uh, the March for Climate Justice in Dublin on November 6th, which will coincide with the COP. Um, and I imagine there'll be an awful lot of other events uh, uh, between now and the middle of uh, November when it is over. Um, so, John, thank you uh, again for that. We really appreciate you uh, giving up your time. You, you, you really do fantastic work uh, on, on so many different media outlets uh, in, in keeping attention uh, on this very, very important issue. And, and um, likewise for that front party, if I may say, you, you know, you're playing an absolute blinder, uh, as is the IWT, but, but you in particular. And, and thank you again for the invite. And, uh, you know, it's, it's you know, it, change is possible. I, I, I stick stubbornly with that. I know I get a little doomy around the edges, but I stick with that idea. It is too early to be given up. Let's just stick at it. Yeah, here, here. Well, that's a good note uh, for us to finish on. And I just want to thank everybody uh, at home for tuning in. Quite a few comments there about whether the slides and so on would be available online. This event has been recorded and I will be getting it on the website uh, probably later this week. So watch our social media. I will post the various links. Uh, so thank you, everybody. And uh, thanks again to John and good night. Cheers, Mike.